Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Anthony Murnau. Today we talk with the mayor of a border community in New Mexico to learn more about how recent changes in the state with the legalization of adult use cannabis may impact economic development in the community. Also, we will discuss how immigration issues and policy may impact the community, which is located on the U.S.-Mexico border. Please welcome to the program the mayor of the city of Sunland Park, Javier Perea. Mayor Perea, thank you so much for being with us. No, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate to be on the show yet once again. Thank you. Now, now that adult use cannabis is legal in New Mexico, I'd like to hear from you. What possibilities do you see with this new industry and how it may impact economic development in your community? Um, what we see, I think, uh, I think first and foremost is we're all excited about this, this new industry coming into our area. Um, and, and I know I actually I was at a, at a presentation this last Saturday and someone referred to it as as the Dubai of New Mexico the marijuana industry, uh, because one thing is we have the population, you know, the, the metropolitan area here uh, in the borderline includes El Paso, Texas, Ciudad Juarez, and that's more than 2 million people. That's more than the entire state of New Mexico, uh, an entire area that we can serve is. So it, it's we were excited about the, 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 the revenues that are going to be able to come in. Uh, but our hope is not just only on marijuana. Our hope is that this can serve as a catalyst for further economic development within the city of Southern Park. So we're looking to, uh, you know, diversify the entertainment venues that we do have available here within the city, uh, but also incorporate outdoor recreation uh, for the community and for visitors to come here and visit us in Southern Park. Okay, so, I mean, with this industry, though, what are some steps that you've taken to really make sure you have the best opportunity available for entrepreneurs and uh, businesses in your community? So actually, when when the, the, the thought of marijuana being legal was, you know, was presented and OK, well, how are we going to govern this? Uh, at first, the idea was to restrict it to certain areas within the city, at least the retail component, just to restrict it to the entertainment corridor, which or the entertainment district that we have adopted. Uh, but just uh, considering the the amount of traffic that, that we would be pushing into one small area within the city, uh, was uh, was a little concerning. Uh, so I know the council now has uh, allowed for retail sales across the entire city of Sunland Park. Um, we are looking at uh, potentially allowing consumption zones right now, specifically in the entertainment corridor, because we want that area to fill up with entertainment. Um, but but that's one thing that we that we are adopting, and then we are still in the process of, of considering uh, time restrictions. Right now, there's nothing proposed 100% just yet but uh, time restrictions uh, might be coming um, or, or will be considered by the council at this point. Uh, but that's, that's stuff that we're gonna be looking up uh, at on the next, in the next couple of months uh, as we progress and as this, this industry continues to evolve within our community. Now, marijuana is still illegal at the federal level and you live in an area where folks may be subject to be stopped by border patrol or immigration officials uh, on the border. Uh, so I'd like to hear from you. What are your conversations like with federal uh, law enforcement officials about this issue? Well, I, I, th I think e even they came out, they came out uh, recently about talking uh, or mentioning that it is still a federal. It's not uh, allowed federally. Uh, so people cannot take it across checkpoints in New Mexico. Um, uh, for the most part, it's been quiet. I, I think if people just restrict to the you know, personal use at this point, uh, I mean, even, even I mean, driving under the influence is a, a crime within the state of New Mexico. So that's something that we will continue to enforce. Uh, but it, it, it's been pretty quiet. I think we, uh, in the time that we have, we have had sales here, that we have, there hasn't been a lot of issues uh, that I'm aware of, uh, where there's a lot of you know, law enforcement uh, presence required or anything like that. So um, I, I think people are sticking to you know, the personal consumption of it uh, in their homes. And, and we hope that it stays that way until we, we actually get uh, the consumption zones approved here within the city of Southern Park. Now, you mentioned checkpoints uh, throughout southern New Mexico near the border. Folks are subject to go through these checkpoints. This is a cash industry. So if business owners are moving product or cash, 
What are your concerns about that and how it may possibly impact uh, future investors who may be wanting to invest in Sunland Park with this industry? You know, from what I'm hearing, I think the private sector is is still, I guess, willing to take that risk <laughs> with the federal government. And I, I'm, I, I'm, I am limited to the my jurisdiction within the city of Sunland Park, uh, but I, I think uh, just the potential of the, the the income potential that exists within the city of Sunland Park is, is I think, great enough for where people can consider or will consider, uh, you know, opening shops here within the city of Sunland Park, uh, and that is transporting a you know uh, product across the state of New Mexico. I mean, you mentioned you haven't seen any issues yet. I mean, it's a relatively new industry uh, in New Mexico, um, very new. So as I mentioned, it, it being a cash industry, uh, there has been growing calls for banking reform with this industry due to robberies at dispensaries across the country. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have a stance on that? Uh, absolutely, I, I, reform is necessary. And, and, and to be quite frank, I, I don't think, or. I, I don't believe that that, that marijuana is going to be uh, illegal forever. I think there's, you know, as more states become to or go to uh, legalize uh, marijuana, I think eventually the federal government's going to, you know, make it legal as well. Uh, so it, it's it's either the reforms going to come in the banking industry or you know it's not going to be a federal issue uh, with it being legal then. So I don't know which one's going to come first. Uh, that, that would depend on the federal government to take action on that. Yeah, and we've seen some businesses invest heavily in security, uh, some upwards, upwards of spending around $50,000 a month for security because this is a cash business and there has been more reports of robberies at dispensaries. So your thoughts on this issue, do you think this could possibly hurt entrepreneurs in New Mexico? Who can't afford to, uh, you know, invest in such security? I, I think to a certain degree, but I, I think what I'm what I'm seeing so far is that people realize that that even just starting the business, it, it does take some investment, especially here within the city of Salem Park. Uh, we we're just about out of space uh, uh, with buildings, uh, and a lot of the new dispensaries that are going to be coming in are going to have to build brand new facilities. Uh, so a lot of people do know that the investment is going to have to be done to build a facility. And once that facility is built, obviously include security features in that. Now, what we do have today, though, is that, that the businesses that are uh, open right now, uh, you know, there's a police station. You know, there's a the dispensary right across the street from the police department here at the city of Southern Park. Uh, so I know that one. I, I'm, I'm sure they're counting on, on good security there at this moment. Um, and then we have two other shops. Uh, just are down the street so i know we are our, our police our police station being close i think does offer some 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 comfort in that there is security in the area so what are the conversations like with your local law enforcement uh, about this new industry and trying to find that balance uh, with it um obviously like any new industry there's always concerns concerns of what's going to happen uh, and not really having a real uh uh, a guide across the state to follow. Um, I mean, it's, it's, we're trying to look at uh, what's working elsewhere. Um, I mean, they, they have expressed concerns about, for example, when we, when we consider the times for uh, the sales uh, that, um, that perhaps they should close earlier. But there's also a consideration to go in the other extreme of not closing, uh, I mean, leaving that to the market to dictate what the hour should be. Uh, but. The concern is about you know the shops closing at the same time that bars close in the area and in El Paso, Texas, and then having for police officers to respond to you know calls for in that deal with marijuana and also calls that deal with you know you know it be domestic violence because of alcohol or things like that. Um, so I mean it's it's always a challenge and it's a it's a balance that we have to work out. Uh, but until we go through those experiences, some of these issues we won't be able to. Uh, uh, define and be able to um, address until we actually uh, deal with it the first uh, first hand. Now, as you mentioned, uh, Southern Park, so close to El Paso's metropolitan area, um, and marijuana is illegal in Texas and El Paso, adult use cannabis, that is. So I'd like to hear from you. How do you see your location playing a role in the growth of this industry? I mean, it's going to be huge. <laughs> It's, um, I know, you know, being that it's illegal in Texas, I mean, they, 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 want, they don't want people to take it over to Texas, but I, I guarantee you that there's probably 
a majority of the, the sales that are happening right now in New Mexico are people from Texas. I mean, you, you can drive to any of the locations now and you can see Texas plates. Um, and, that's, and that's why what we're trying to do is, is focus on, you know, developing this entertainment corridor. We want to bring in more hotels, we want to bring more spaces where people can come and stay here. Uh, and if they want to consume it, they can consume it in these consumption areas and not have to take it to Texas. Um, so, so we are we are aware of, of that particular issue, and and that's 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 our push for for developing uh, this entire area, and also to develop a downtown core for the city of Sunland Park. Now, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on really with this law that was in place with the adult use cannabis industry in New Mexico. Are there some things that you would like to see changed to the law to better ensure success with the growth of the industry in your community? You know, it's. I would love to have an answer to that, but I, I really don't know at this point. Uh, uh, I, I know every single state has something different. Uh, what's going to work in New Mexico? I, I, I don't know just yet, uh, but I, I am open to. Okay, once we see things happen, okay, maybe to to changes to the law, uh, improvements. But from from what I've heard so far, is that that this has been the best or friendliest law um, that allows this industry to thrive. Um, uh, across any state in, in the union at this point. Uh, but I, I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not familiar with this industry other than what has been presented to us this, this particular year through New Mexico. Now, you mentioned earlier in this interview that you want to develop the economy, you know, not just with this industry, but other industries. How do you see the adult use cannabis industry perhaps helping other industries in your community? And which industries would that be? So, so one of those things is one of the things that we want to develop in Sunland Park, because right now you can drive to the city of Sunland Park and there's no real identity at this point. So what we're, our hope is to develop a downtown corridor that includes an entertainment uh, uh, zone or district. And also we have an arts and cultural district that we want to develop. And then a, a beauty that we have as well is the Rio Grande it runs right smack through the middle of it. And uh, we want to develop a rural river walk and, and that sort of become the, the head of the, uh, the Rio Grande Trail that, you know, wants to extend all the way from Santa Fe down to, uh, to, to here to Sunland Park and connecting eventually to El Paso, Texas. Um, so it, it's just being able to provide amenities for all these type of activities, um, including marijuana and, and diversify the, the, the entertainment available, I think is important. So we, we, we want to, we welcome the industry, but we're not going to put all of our eggs in that one basket and say this is going to be the saving grace for the city. No, this is just, I think, a small component of a much bigger picture. Because I know that in the future, once marijuana becomes legal, be it in Texas or in, in the uh, federal government, we're going to lose that niche. Uh, and our hope is that the businesses that do get established here within the city of Southern Park continue to thrive beyond that. Uh, and, and that's going to happen with the diversification of our industries and, and, and the commercial districts within the city of Summon Park. Now, you also mentioned the outdoor industry as a potential industry for growth in your area. You mentioned the trail along the Rio. You also have some hiking in the area. Where do you see potential with that industry? Uh, I mean, there's, uh, I think I had uh, read at one point that, or in some area that the outdoor economy in New Mexico can, can gener or generates up to $2 billion a year, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, and I mean, we have here in the Cristo Rey, which is um, uh, manned by the Catholic Church, uh, and that one draws about 30 to 40,000 people every single year. Uh, and that could also serve as a trailhead uh, to connect to the rest of the state. Um, and, and I think if we, if we, if we, you know, can provide outdoor recreation um, along with, you know, urban amenities, that we, we can really diversify, diversify the group of individuals that come and visit our communities here in New Mexico. Because uh, not only that, we can connect to you know to the to the to the wineries just up the road here from New Mexico, or, in, or where you can take Highway 28 and take a drive through the breweries that are popping up in that area, you know, in 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 La Mesa and, and things like that. So I, I mean, if this can be a starting point, Las Cruces can be an ending point for some of these entertainment venues. Um, I'd be happy to uh, lead the charge in that. Okay, I'd like to talk with you about uh, immigration and migration, since your city is located right on the U.S.-Mexico border right there. Uh, Customs and Border Protection released some data recently that there were over 165,000 migrant encounters in February and in March, over 221,300 encounters uh, with border officials in the area. Your thoughts about uh, how this impacts your community 
when you have um, all these encounters happening um, you know, across the border, but you're directly on the border. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about what are some things that makes your community unique when dealing with these challenges? Um, as you mentioned, we are right smack on the border. Actually, from where I'm sitting right now in City Hall, you know, I can walk, you know, you know, less than a mile and I'll be in, in Mexico or less than a mile and be in, in, in El Paso, Texas. Um, so we're, we're at that point where New Mexico meets Texas and Mexico and, and these issues are a daily occurrence for us each and every day. Um, the impact that has, it has had in our community is obviously we've seen an increase in calls for trespassing or for suspicious activity. And we have to deploy our police department to each and every one of those calls. And sometimes they are just migrants, so sometimes we do have to defer that back to Border Patrol. Um, but I mean, that's that's time that a police officer has to take off uh, to address this issue and, and has to sometimes hold off on addressing other issues that are affecting the community as well. Um, so, you know, we have to prioritize our calls at that point. Uh, another issue is our fire department, for example, um, you know, we have to respond to a lot of injuries. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have Cristo Rey here. Uh, people that migrate through this area have you know, crossed through that mountain. Uh, and it is a dangerous mountain if you're not on a particular trail. Uh, and, um, you know, we've had deaths on Cristo Rey uh, in the past, and that's going to continue on because sometimes people don't know the terrain. And, and sometimes people who come in from outside of different uh, uh, areas are not acclimated to the desert climate here. And we've, we found people, you know, you know, dehydrated in the desert or, or, or even dead in the desert. Uh, and our fire department has to respond to each and every one of those calls. Um, and so over the years, actually, we've had to invest monies into our fire department to, to retrofit vehicles so that they can uh, go into these, you know, mountainous terrains or into the deserts because a regular pumper truck uh, can't uh, access these, these different areas. Now it's been announced that Title 42, the public health order, is scheduled to expire uh, May 23rd, I believe. This order was put in place uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19. The Biden and Trump administration have used this policy. Um, it has allowed them to immediately expel a large portion of migrants and refugees who are detained at the border, uh, citing COVID-19 concerns. So I'd like to hear from you. Do you have any concerns about Title 42 expiring? Um, I don't think it's a lot about Title 42 that I'm concerned about. It's, I think more, I'm more concerned about the entire immigration process that exists within the United States. And until that gets addressed, no matter you know what we apply to it, it it's, it's not going to get fixed. Um, you know, some people think that building a wall is going to address the immigration issue. That's not going to happen. There is a wall here within the city of Salem Park, and that has incurred the migration. Uh, so I, I think the federal government has to work on, 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 on streamlining the process for immigration, uh, for legal immigration, so that people prefer to take those avenues rather than, than going through, uh, through, through you know, Cuban traffickers. Um, and also address the issues for why people want to migrate into the United States. Uh, if we can help bring some stability to you know, Latin American countries or other countries for, from where they're coming from, uh, I think that would you know, curb uh, the, the need for people to come or the want to come here to the United States. So, I mean, there's been many different perspectives on how to solve the immigration issue in the United States, how to address it. But from somebody who is actually on the border, I mean, what are some things that you think politicians in Washington need to understand uh, who may just view the border in a, perhaps a black and white view from national uh, television where some may think it's more of a gray issue? It, it, it is, uh, I, I think uh, not everyone understands the dynamics of the border. And then you have people who live thousands of miles away from the border, not really you know, understanding the importance of trade that happens in the border, the importance of you know the, the, the binational communities that exist along the border. Uh, for example, we have employees that, that work here within the city of Southern Park and live in Mexico. Uh, and they're you know, participating citizens of our community each and every day. Uh, we have, um, you know, at one point I had a city councilor who lived here in Sunland Park in Mexico and, and worked in, in, in the plant in, in, in Juarez. Uh, so, so I think immigration, it, it, you know, the border and immigration, it, it's a much bigger picture than, 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 we, than sometimes people tend to focus uh, on. And immigration, if you want to stop people coming through, you know, illegal means, 
uh, you know, if, if you're going to put uh, barriers, then you have to man those barriers with both technology and people. Uh, so you can just put, you know, waste infrastructure dollars and then leave it empty and or leave it unmanned. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's not one clear, I don't think, solution to the issue, but I, I think if, you, if, you, if the Congress really works uh, with the president to address the issue, uh, you know, the immigrant, actually bring immigration reform and then streamline the process at the federal level, that I think it would make it easier for people to prefer to take that legal avenue rather than, than you know, you know, the illegal avenues. Okay, so we have candidates who are running for governor in New Mexico who are touting getting tough on border security. We've had some call for a border strike force. People call for strengthening border security. Sometimes they don't issue a plan, but I'd like to hear from you, what are some things that these candidates need to consider uh, from a leader in a border community when they make these, these calls? Uh, I think, you know, one of the issues that people have to look at is, okay, the importance of building relationships. And, and luckily over the years that I've been here, we have fostered a very good relationship with Border Patrol. Um, and many times they're, they're, they don't have enough personnel uh, and we, we, we respond to requests for help in, in, in situations where you know the, the, the officer or the border patrol agent might be I might sense feel in danger and we do respond to you know issues you know uh, safety issues uh, more than anything we don't do immigration enforcement at the city of Park uh, but it, it, I think it is important to people realize that, that 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 protecting the border is not just building a wall or just uh, 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 you know you know having a, a field day out here and then uh, making a one-time investment. It, it's, it's a consistent issue that has, or a consistent uh, uh, item that has to be funded. And I think most importantly, it, it's, it's, with, it's with personnel uh, and systems and processes that are, that are, that are you know, seamless uh, in, in addressing all of these issues. Uh, if we have a chaotic environment and we don't have the personnel to actually uh, address these issues, I mean, all the ideas might be grandiose and they're never going to, fix the actual problems. Now, where, what are some of the, th the things you think that politicians in Washington could address that may help uh, this, the situation along the border when it comes to immigration or illegal immigration? Um, again, I'm, I'm gonna mention that, you know, obviously funding border patrol is, is very important and bringing in technology into the border area is also important. Uh, even for example, uh, supporting municipalities like ours, uh, where you know we do have to respond to you know because of immigration issues, our, you know our police department has to respond to additional calls each and every day. Uh, but you know having now us having to retrofit vehicles to address uh, you know immigration issues, our our fire trucks and things like that. I mean those are this, those are impacts that are, are you know our, our low income commu community can't afford uh, in many situations. And and to be able to uh, you know address this federal issue, I think that the federal government should also. Uh, uh, put money aside for communities such as ours. Now, I'd like to hear from you though also, as people who, who want to invest in Sunland Park, when you talk to companies, when you talk to future possible investors, what are some questions they ask you and do they bring up any concerns about being located on the border? You know, uh, the, the companies that I've talked to, not, not very many mention the issue of immigration, um, but I, I think when, when people look at this area, they, they, they see the the importance of trade and the access that we have to to another country. Uh, there, there's, I mean, we're we're at the at the heart of the of the U.S. where you know a lot of goods go back and forth here, and, and there's you know there's the, the potential of using you know manufacturing in Mexico and being able to easily transport this to the United States. Uh, I, I think it was is is very enticing for a lot of companies. So immigration hasn't really been an issue for us or that has been raised to us from companies looking to move into the area. Of course, security is a concern, but uh, and I mean, we're still one of the safest communities in the state of New Mexico, uh, despite the, you know, the migrants that pass through our community. Now, uh, we just have a couple of minutes left, but you're located near the port in Santa Teresa, where there's a growing economic development with the industries. Um, New Mexico has had a record-breaking year over the last year uh, with exports, thanks to a large portion of the business activities happening there. How does that impact uh, the growth of your city? 
I mean, that's all fantastic. And, and we within the city of Sunland Park uh, support the growth in the Santa Teresa industrial development. And that's why we also support the development of a port of entry within the city of Sunland Park as well. And, and our focus is more for non-commercial traffic. But we, what we continue to support is the, the, the commercial growth in the Santa Teresa area and then, you know, uh, move, remove some of that traffic or the com non-commercial traffic into the you know the downtown core that we we're trying to build within the city of Southern Park. So we're very very supportive of that. And over the years, um, as as businesses go up in Santa Teresa, we continue to see that you know the residential growth within our community. And what we hope comes next is the commercial growth within the the, the residents or within the commercial areas in the city of Southern Park. Uh, because the last thing we want to see is is people get these wonderful jobs now in Santa Teresa and go and spend their money in in, in in another state. So we want to make sure that we we can provide here within the city of Sunland Park, you know, the jobs. We can provide places where they can spend that money and also where they can play each and every day. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Mayor of the city of Sunland Park, Javier Perea, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate the uh, the time. Thank you. I want to thank you for joining us for Fronteras a Changing America. I'm Anthony Morano. We'll see you next time on the program. Don't forget that we're on social media as well. You can always like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our KRWG News YouTube channel. 